Well, Happy New Year. Um, as you see, of course, we have the new missiles that we are uh, starting with this week. Um, I think that they're fairly, they should be fairly easy to figure out. I know that they're a little bit different, but of course, at the front there, there's kind of the order of the mass, then you'll find the readings um, and the hymns. And then at the back, I think some things that can really be helpful. There are a number of uh, prayers in the back um, before and after mass. Um, some, you know, some of the kind of like basic things of, of our faith, um, like the, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and stuff like that. Um, and, and then, of course, at the very back, uh, benediction, adoration. Um, and um, on the back cover, the St. Michael's Prayer, which uh, we'll be getting back to saying at the end of Mass uh, more frequently as I remember it. Um, so I hope that these will be good for us um, as we kind of move into this new liturgical year. Um, I also wanted to remind you at the back of, of the church, if you have not uh, and you need to, uh, there are the sign-up sheets for envelopes, or if you have them and you don't need them, or if you'd like help with the offertory uh, online uh, giving. Um, and again, this week there are the bulletin inserts. And the one that, other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, kind of the uh, liturgical edition for Advent, um, there will be um, adoration with a, a holy hour and confessions uh, every Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30 at St. Patrick's. Um, so that's right before religious ed. Um, so again, every Wednesday, uh, you're welcome to join um, for the whole hour, for 30 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you can do. Um, but um, we'll be, have their um, adoration and confessions from 5.30 to 6.30 at St. Patrick's. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, um, as we move into Lent and we start this new liturgical year, um, I wanted to do a little bit, something a little bit different for Advent, um, and that's to kind of develop a theme for Advent. And there's kind of two parts of this. And so we're not, it's not really going to be focusing on the reading so much, but more on the season and get us, getting us into the season. And so the first part of this theme is going to be focusing on Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, and kind of walking with Mary and Joseph through Advent. Part of this is going to be inspired by uh, what we call imaginative contemplation or imaginative prayer, which is where uh, you read scripture and you place yourself in that scripture, either as one of the characters or somebody kind of looking on and kind of seeing what goes on. And so that's how we're going to kind of approach uh, Advent. And the second focus is going to be on the four major themes of Advent, which you may already know. They are hope, peace, joy, and love. And each one of those is going to be kind of a focus of one of the weeks. So first, walking with the parents, and second, one of those major uh, themes of Advent. And so this first week, I wanted to start with Mary and with the hope of the Annunciation, the thing that kind of kicks off, so to speak, Advent. The hope that comes from following the will of God. And so to ponder the Annunciation, which one person called a singular moment of greatest importance. But in order to understand the Annunciation, which is, of course, Gabriel coming to Mary, we have to know who is Mary. Who is Mary? Well, we don't know a lot about her, but we know enough to kind of get an idea of who she was. We know that she was a simple girl from a simple village, the village of Nazareth, which had probably only about 100 to 150 people not too far off from maybe where we live, only about 20 to 30 families, so a very small community. And as we know from Scripture, a town that wasn't thought much of. Right? Remember from Scripture, Nathaniel says, what good has ever come from Nazareth? So it was kind of an un, unthought of town, but yet one of the most important people in history actually two most important people from history, came from that small town of Nazareth. And Mary, how old was she? Well, we know that she was betrothed to Joseph, and the usual age of betrothal was between about 12 and 14. 
So we can say that she was probably about 14 years old. So a very young girl. But one who was specially chosen by God from all time. From all the women in history, she was chosen by God. And given a special grace to be without sin. We know that from the Immaculate Conception, which we will uh, celebrate next week. And we know that also, especially from the words of Gabriel when he visits her. His first words, he says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Hail, full of grace. That means she is full of grace. She is without sin. That's what full of grace means. She is so full of grace that there is no place for sin in her life. With these words, she was greatly troubled. And who wouldn't be? And so, of course, Gabriel says, do not be afraid, Mary. The words that God says to us all the time, do not be afraid. Gabriel is speaking to her, but he's also speaking to all of us. Because we all are there at the Annunciation. All of humanity is with Mary at this very moment, waiting for her answer. This is the hinge of history. The hinge of history. She could either say yes or no. But the angels have every bit of faith in her. And so they tell us, do not be afraid. And Gabriel goes on to say, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, which as we might know means God saves. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel here is speaking to the promises and expectations of the Old Testament. This is why we must know the Old Testament. If we don't know the Old Testament, none of this makes sense. It means nothing to us. But yet Mary knew. She knew exactly what he was talking about. She wasn't well educated. Women weren't educated at that time. She couldn't read or write. But she knew scripture. Because we once knew that the most important thing for us to know is the word of God. Now, numerous other times in Scripture, there are angels who promised women that they will give birth. But this one is very unique. Because all other times, the woman was older and barren. But now we have a young maiden, an unwed maiden. Well, she is betrothed, but that means that she was married legally, but she still lived with her parents. And was married in all things but fulfilling the conjugal act. Tradition says that she may have even made a vow of virginity. Which was not unheard of in ancient Israel in her time. But we hear this amazing proclamation. That he will be the son of the most high. A unique title that is used throughout Luke's readings, writings. Meaning the son of God that he will be given the throne of David, meaning he will be the new king of Israel to rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is the true everlasting kingdom that is promised. And when we hear this, we know how absurd that song, Mary, did you know is? Because yes, of course she knew. She was told by Gabriel. And what's her answer to this amazing proclamation? She says, how can this be, since I have no relations with a man? Now, what's interesting is earlier in the same chapter, this first chapter of Luke, we heard Gabriel also talk to Zechariah in the temple, promising that his wife, Elizabeth, would would give birth. But she was old. She was barren. And what does he say? It sounds like he almost says the same exact thing. He says, well, how could that be? 
But it's the way that's said that's different. Zechariah doesn't believe. He says that's impossible. And because of that, he's struck silent. He can no longer speak. But Mary, instead, questioned not in doubt, but in belief. She says, yes, I believe you, but how can that happen? How? And so Gabriel responds, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Nothing. And now, the moment where all humanity waits with bated breath. As one author says, it's a hushed moment in the history of the universe when the fate of the whole world hung on the response of a little girl. Or as St. Bernard said, tearful Adam with his souring, souring family begs this of you, O loving virgin, in their exile from paradise. Abraham begs it. David begs it. All the other holy patriarchs, your ancestors, ask it of you as they dwell in the country of the shadow of death. This is what the whole earth waits for, prostrate at your feet. It is right in doing so, for on your word depends comfort for the wretched, ransom for the captive, freedom for the condemned, indeed salvation for all the sons of Adam, the whole of your race. Answer quickly, O virgin. Reply in haste to the angel, or rather, through the angel to the Lord. Answer with a word. Receive the word of God. Speak your own word. Conceive the divine word. Breathe a passing word. Embrace the eternal word. And her response. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to thy word. Mary's fiat. Let it be done. The most important yes in history. It's the same word that God spoke to begin history. And Mary says it here to restart history by the word becoming flesh. Her fiat, her yes, is an act of complete humility and complete faith in God and his will. Because Mary knows that his will is greater than our will. She knows what she's saying could potentially make her face great persecution, exile, even death, stoning. Because she's not supposed to have a child now but yet she will be pregnant. But she has faith. She has trust. She has hope in God. More than thinking about herself, more important is God's will. And this is the beginning of our hope. Our hope ultimately is in Jesus Christ and his saving act. But it only could happen because of Mary's fiat. And this is how we should approach our life. Yes, difficulties. Yes, persecution. Yes, sufferings. But these are secondary to God's will. God comes to us every day as Gabriel did, asking us to trust him, asking for our daily fiat, always starting with fear not. And so this is the first Advent challenge for us this year, to discern God's will in our lives and to humbly say yes, no matter how difficult, in the hope of the resurrection that only comes from following him. And so to that teenage girl who had more humility, more courage, more love, more faith, and more hope, than we can ever imagine. Thank you, Mary, for your yes that changed the course of history. 
Thank you, Mary, for your yes that is the beginning of our hope. Thank you, Mary, for your example of placing God's will first in our lives. Thank you, Mom. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.